Hello, and welcome to the Global Impacts of COVID-19 webinar series. My name is Wendy Hunter Barker, and I'm an Assistant Dean here at the School of Global Policy and Strategy. By now, many of you are becoming well acquainted with GPS, and I hope you've enjoyed learning a little something about the school each week. Today, I'd like to spend a minute on our faculty. The school was founded in 1986 on two novel ideas. First, that it would focus on the Pacific. And second, we wanted to have a truly integrated multidisciplinary faculty. Now those words get bandied about a lot, but GPS really does stand out amongst its peers in both international affairs and public policy schools for the breadth of disciplines represented by the faculty. This word cloud is a good representation. The majority of our faculty are from either economics or political science, but we have a number of management faculty as well as representatives of public policy, engineering, physics, neuroscience, and more. At UC San Diego, we have faculty with joint appointments at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, Rady School of Management, Jacobs School of Engineering, and the Departments of Economics and Political Science. We are a very well-rounded group. And representing that diversity here today are three faculty, all of whom have different technical training. As you know, today's topic is COVID-19's impact on labor, and leading this webinar is GPS Assistant Professor of Management, Liz Lyons. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn this over to you. It's all yours, Liz. Unmute. Okay, thanks, Wendy. I am thrilled to be joined today by two of my colleagues at GPS, as you mentioned both of whom are world-renowned economists and both of whom have made significant contributions to U.S. policy. Alex and Josh both hold faculty positions in the School of Global Policy and Strategy and in the Department of Economics, and they are both research associates at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Prior to joining us at UCSD, Alex Gelber held faculty positions at the Warren School of Business and the UC Berkeley Goldman School of Public Policy. His research focuses on American economic policy, including the employment and earnings effects of social security and tax policy. From 2012 to 2013, Alex served as De Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the US Treasury Department. And in 2013, he served as Acting Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy and Acting Chief Economist at Treasury. In addition to being the Pacific Economic Cooperation Chair in International Economic Relations here at UC San Diego, Josh Kraft Ziffin serves dual roles as Director of the Center on Global Transformation and Co-Director of the Global Health Institute. In 2004-2005, he served as a Senior econo Economist for Health and the Environment on the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Josh has published research in leading economic and science journals on a range of topics, including the relationship between health and human capital and the economics of innovation. In today's session, as Wendy mentioned, we're going to be discussing the micro and macro economic shifts in labor supply and demand in response to COVID-19. Alex is going to open our discussion by providing an overview of current employment trends and policy responses to COVID's impact on employment. Josh will lead a discussion on how employment will look for those who maintain their jobs and how this may evolve post-COVID. I will conclude the panel presentation portion of the hour by discussing the implications of shifts to remote work for management and productivity. We will spend the remainder of our time on Q&A um, and so that we can be ready to begin that Q&A portion, please ask questions in the Q&A box as they come to you. Okay, we're gonna begin with Alex. If he's ready, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Liz, and it's a pleasure to be here today. So I just wanna start out by quickly giving some high level overviews of uh, the impact of COVID on the labor market. Um, so uh, since <clears throat> the beginning of the sort of COVID episode, there are uh, almost 39 million workers that had uh, newly filed unemployment as of the latest data, which came out uh, this morning, um, which, which goes through last week. Um, it's thought that there may be more um, that have not yet been able to file unemployment because um, because unemployment offices have been overwhelmed with work and, and some people have not uh, yet been able to file. Um, some of the latest data, however, indicates that um, the employment losses, the actual employment losses may be uh, stabilizing on the basis of um, survey evidence from Civis Analytics, although that's, that's 
uh, probably less reliable than the, the actual employer survey that the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, uses that'll, that'll come up soon. So, um, so I would say it, it, it certainly, um, the, the employment losses have been very large. Um, they were 2.4 million additional uh, workers just in the last week. Um, it may be stabilizing, but there's still some uncertainty around that. Um, and, and just for some context, that's out of a labor force around 160 million total. So this is around a quarter of the workforce that has, um, is, is newly filed for unemployment. Broadly speaking, it appears to have hit women uh, harder than men, um, partly uh, for a number of reasons, partly due to the fact that um, not all jobs can be performed by home and from home, and there are um, a disproportionate number of jobs um, that uh, women uh, do that um, that are that are in uh, person in one way or another. Um, in fact, economists estimate uh, uh, Jonathan Dingle and, and Brent Nyman at the University of Chicago uh, Booth School of Business estimate that um, only about 37% of jobs can be done from home. So uh, there's certainly um, you know the uh, the possibility that if this episode is uh, more sustained that you know even more workers uh, uh, in the long run will not be able to do their jobs uh, particularly effectively. Those job losses have been remarkably um, widespread across different uh, sectors um, and uh, so you know there's sort of a diffusion index that economists can calculate of how diffuse the employment losses are across industries and it it appears that it's that it's a remarkably diffuse uh, job loss across uh, industries, um, uh, consistent with uh, with uh, the idea that that you know across industries, you know, a minority of workers can actually um, effectively complete their jobs from home. Um, but it is still more concentrated, as you might imagine, in certain industries. Leisure and hospitality, in the latest employment report uh, that the Bureau of Labor Statistics put out, um, employment in leisure and hospitality had gone down by nearly eight million. Uh, people or 47%. So nearly 47% had lost uh, their jobs. And this was as of mid-April um, is where the latest, when, when the latest statistics are through. Um, and uh, three quarters of that decrease occurred in food services and drinking. Employment also fell um, quite a bit in uh, arts, entertainment, and recreation. So, um, so, you know, this sort of makes sense because, you know, in an industry like leisure and hospitality, first of all, a lot of, um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the work occurs in person, like in food services and, and drinking establishments, and then a lot of the other work there aren't any customers because no one wants to travel to a hotel right now, um, or you know necessarily go out and and be in a restaurant with a bunch of other people that you might catch COVID from. So um, so I think that you know moving forward, um, you know. There's a lot of uncertainty about how this will evolve. I certainly am no expert on the epidemiology of the situation. I think, um, you know, that said, my understanding is that the epidemiology itself is quite uncertain. Um, and moreover, it's quite uncertain, you know, whether a vaccine will be developed, whether an effective treatment will be developed within a shorter timeline versus a longer timeline. So I think even just starting from the public health problem, which of course is where this problem starts, there's a lot of uncertainty. And then when you play it forward to the economic problem, there just becomes even more uncertainty. So I would say that, you know, you know, uh, Liz and Josh and I will all give our opinions about, you know, what this will do. But I will just say that from my own perspective, we can all kind of talk about what it has done. But in terms of moving forward, I would, I believe that it's highly uncertain. Um, starting with the epidemiology and then moving forward into uh, the economic impact. Um, in terms of, you know, the government role, it has been quite large in combating this epidemic. Um, so the, uh, the CARES Act um, is uh, sort of the biggest uh, act. It was sort of the, the um, third tier of, um, of major government support to combat uh, this COVID episode. And um, in terms of the labor market specifically, there were a number of provisions and specifically the, the biggest ones related to unemployment insurance. Um, so it expanded unemployment insurance to a broader group of workers, including self-employed workers um, and others that have to um, deal with the fallout of COVID in various ways. And then it also ex extended the length of unemployment insurance support uh, for individuals. And then finally, it expanded um, the amount of support uh, once you are on unemployment insurance. And specifically, there's a $600 uh, 
um, a week supplement to uh, the unemployment insurance uh, payments that you would otherwise be getting, which is actually quite large, particularly for those at the bottom end of the income distribution. So although those at the bottom end of the income distribution were harder hit, um, it looks like by the COVID episode itself in terms of, well, not only the public health uh, aspects of this, but also the, the un unemployment fallout because they're disproportionately in jobs that can't be done from home, um, the government support has been stronger at the bottom end of the income distribution relative to people's prior income. So in particular, economists talk about a concept called the replacement rate, which is defined as the fraction of people's prior income that's replaced by a government program, in this case, unemployment insurance. And it turns out that due to this $600 supplement, um, replacement rates have actually been above 100% um, for many, many workers. And in fact, average replacement rates are well above 100% um, in a lot of cases. So like in, the, well, they vary across states because unemployment insurance is, um, is run on a state-by-state -state basis within certain federal guidelines. Um, <clears throat> but in the uh, most quote-unquote generous state, um, average replacement rates are above 120%. So in other words, um, people are getting uh, above 20% more than their prior salary uh, now through unemployment insurance, which is time limited. So it will last for, for four months from when they, when they started their UI. Um, but it still is, you know, um, it is, it is a, a generous supplement on average, um, and uh, and 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 for some workers, it's even it's even more than that. And when I say generous, what I mean specifically is not that the absolute amount is necessarily generous. It doesn't mean that people are getting huge handouts from the government. In some cases, they might not have been earning very much at all before. What I mean is relative to their prior wages, it does appear to be replacing on average more than their prior wages. And in the state of Maine, which is that highest state, it's even more than 20% above their prior wages. There is some variance in that. So like in New Hampshire, which is the least, uh, which is the lowest replacement rate state, it's much lower. So it's, it's a bit above 80% um, in that state. Um, so, um, so I think that that is uh, to some extent combating the, um, you know, the, the inequality that, um, that COVID is creating and, and would otherwise, you know, would, would, be, would be even larger. I think going forward, you know, <clears throat> part of the uncertainty, as I said, is around the public health. Part of the uncertainty is around the public health response. But then the third key, com or a third key component of the uncertainty is around the government response. And, um, you know, policymakers right now are acting actively debating further uh, support for state and local governments, particularly state governments. And um, that's a source of quite a bit of contention um, between Republicans and Democrats right now. So I think it is uncertain, highly uncertain, um, to what extent uh, the government will be willing to continue to support workers in the same way um, after the current provisions from the CARES Act run out after four months after its inception, which at this point is, is around uh, three months uh, away. So, um, so I think that the government response is highly uncertain because, you know, it is coming up on $3 trillion in total, you know, support for the economy that creates, you know, major deficits that are being created, not only through that spending, but also through reduced tax revenue. So, you know, that is something that policymakers, rightly or wrongly, are, are focused on. And I think that, um, that it, is, it is highly uncertain whether the government will continue that extraordinary support for the economy. So I think in terms of the labor market, so far, the, um, the replacement rates uh, in terms of, you know, unemployment insurance have been strong and have helped to kind of prop up the labor market and the broader economy. But I think beyond uh, uh, the current round of support and maybe one more round uh, for supporting uh, uh, lower levels of government, it's highly uncertain and therefore highly uncertain what, what will happen uh, to the U.S. economy. I think it's probably untenable to have um, people uh, with, you know, basically cutting them off entirely, but the extent to which um, normal UI will, will, be, um, will be supplemented, I think, is still uh, uh, quite uncertain. And um, obviously, this will interact with the extent to which the economy opens up again, um, because it may be that the economy um, will open up and, um, and at that point, the extraordinary support for the labor market will um, not be completely unnecessary, but, but maybe uh, less necessary. And, um, you know, on that front, I think, um, 
you know, again, there's there's quite a bit of uncertainty about government policy, as as uh, you know, I'm sure everyone will will recognize both about opening up of jobs, but also the related issue of opening up of childcare. And I think right now there are people, you know, who are being asked to come back to work, who may not be comfortable coming back to work, who may, um, you know, face significant uh, health threats for their health from coming back to work and or who may not be able to afford the childcare to be able to come back to work. So as we move forward and government you know, has to plot its, its responses uh, to this evolving situation, I think that will be one of the most, uh, the most interesting uh, questions is when do we open up, how do we open up, and then how does the government respond on the other end in terms of continuing to support the labor market. So, uh, so that brings me to the, the end of my remarks and I'll be happy to answer questions um, on the other end. Great, I'll just um, I'll just pick up from there. Thanks, Alex. That was that was really informative and enjoyable. So let me, while I'm trying to do this, let me share my screen here. Uh, so I want to reiterate something that Alex said, which is that uh, none of us are um, are soothsayers. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. So everything we are saying here will be recorded, and so you can all come back and embarrass us with how wrong we were. 10, 15 years from now when we say what we think is gonna happen. Um, I, I'm here, um, actually, I've got the wrong slide deck up, so let me get the right one. Um, I'm here to talk about the uh, what the workplace is going to look like uh, post COVID. And the one thing, I, so I wanna, I wanna agree with Alex that there's lots of uncertainty here. Uh, I want to agree with Alex that we can't be certain of very many things. Um, what I want to argue is the one thing we can be certain of, or at least I'm willing to be certain of, is that the workplace post-COVID is not going to look like the workplace pre-COVID ever again. Exactly how those things change is, is a little unclear. I want to walk you through at least some of the contours of that. Uh, but that workplace is, is going to be changed permanently. And some of those changes are really just what COVID has done is really accelerated or precipitated some, some changes that were already underway in the, in the labor market. Uh, on the other hand, it's going to generate some changes that, that we hadn't predicted and, and, and furthermore, some that I will not predict here in my talk because, I, because none of us can see perfectly into the future. So let me first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about three things. So I want to think about not the unemployed who may continue to be unemployed or be re-employed re in different sectors. I want to talk about what work from home is going to look like in the near term and the medium term. I want to talk about work in the office is going to look like. And then I want to talk just very briefly about unintended consequences from, from those changes, some potential unintended consequences. So first, let me talk about um, work from home. The thing that I think we need to be clear about, and there's some some recent surveys that, that, like everything COVID, the news changes every single day, so it's impossible to be on top of things. Just today, Facebook announced that they are going to allow some workers to permanently work from home forevermore. Uh, some of some of the other tech companies in Northern California have already announced that at a, at a minimum they will not be opening their office until summer 2021. Um, and so I think it's pretty clear that even as we relax the rules around social distancing and start to open up the economy again, uh, that we're not going to see this mass rush back into the office uh, that looks like uh, business as usual or business, pre, business as usual pre-COVID. Um, I, I think the other thing is that there's some recent surveys that have been put out by Deloitte and Touche um, that have... Uh, that have been focused on on uh, CTOs, chief technology officers at major major Fortune 500 companies, and uh, only about 50% say they're going to go back. They're going to open up the office the moment they have permission from their their state or locality to open up, uh, and 75% say that they will continue to do some rem allow some remote work for the foreseeable future. So. I think what I, and these trends were there, the move towards distance work or remote work, those trends were there. What I think COVID has done is it's really accelerated this transition because we've had no choice. And one of the things that's been very interesting about this uh, experiment, if you will, is that we've learned a lot of things about remote work, some of which is, uh, is surprisingly in the good direction. We've learned that actually people can do a reasonable job 
of, of um, doing their work from home. And that's under extreme conditions where people are home with their children and people are unable to go out to stores. And so one might hope that they could do even better when they didn't have those other constraints. On the other hand, we've also learned some things don't work so well remotely. You can all be the judge about how well webinars work remotely, um, but, but some things work better remotely than others. I think what, what's pretty clear is that as we open up, and I think forevermore, not just in the immediate aftermath, but in the long run, we are gonna see a much bigger move towards a hybrid model in which some folks are in the office and some folks are working remotely, or some folks are sometimes working in the office and sometimes working remotely. And that has pretty profound implications, some of which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, it may even be, and there's been some talk by some, some CEOs who may or may not be, I, I will, it remains to, see, to be seen how, how true this will be, but it's certainly provocative. Some CEOs have said that they may entirely go remotely uh, with the argument that in fact, when you have workers that are mostly remote, you have to actually codify and write down all the rules and expectations. And once you bother to do that, you might as well do that for everyone. And once you're doing it for everyone, why do you need people in the office? I think w one thing that I want to be clear, and this, this is something I, I've thought a lot about because I work on it, um, is that the implications are very different for creative and task-based work. For task-based work, it's very easy to give someone a very clear assignment with clear metrics and goalposts and to monitor that they're accomplishing that task. For tasks that are creative, that is, we sort of vaguely have some sense of what we want to accomplish, but we, we don't have fine parameters on what we need to accomplish or how to get there, uh, there may be much more need for interaction and whether we can do that as well virtually is, is an open question. It's pretty clear that, that uh, one thing I'd say is the, the massive, the naysayers on, on remote work, the ones who said, oh, productivity is gonna plummet uh, people can't do this from home. People can't be trusted to be responsible at home. They've been thus far proven wrong. Um, there have been some drops in productivity and in some sectors more than others. And obviously we haven't tried to make everything remote. So some of those sectors that we haven't tried might do quite poorly, but people in general have done reasonably well. Um, and we're still on the learning steep part of the learning curve here. We're going we're gonna to see the rise of tracking tools and other devices and techniques and Liz is gonna talk a little bit more about these, I hope, or I'm putting her on the spot in any case, uh, to manage wor workers remotely. It's a very different skill set to manage people from a distance than to manage, manage them in person. But those tools um, are gonna be important in, in this transition, permanent transition to at least partial work from home. And I wanna be clear on a point I'll come back to is, even if we see some modest drops in productivity because some of us are spending more time snacking at the refrigerator than working at our computer, um, we're also lowering the cost of office space. And so it may be that when firms do the final calculations on this, they're willing to see a five or 10% drop in worker productivity in exchange for a larger than 10% drop in commercial real estate um, expenses. And we'll come back to that point. That's work from home, but of course, not everyone is gonna be able to work from home. Not all sectors are, are remote, uh, are, not, are amenable to this kind of change. And on top of that, uh, my suspicion, at least once the immediate aftermath of COVID has cleared, is that we will not see massive scales, people moving to remote work on a massive scale um, monolithically, but rather cycling between in the office and out of the office. And that also has implications for what the office is going to look like. So let me um, figure out how to advance my slides here. Uh, Maybe if I, there we go. So uh, first, um, the, 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 let me say in the immediate term, there's this 10-4 work plan. I don't know if anyone's um, been reading about this. It's getting some coverage in popular press. Uh, it was hatched by uh, a bunch of Israelis initially. And this 10-4 work plan is quite elegant in its simplicity. It recognizes that there's a latency period after one gets infected with the virus before they can infect others. And that latency period is approximately four days. So the, the proposal here, at least for those who have to be in the workplace, is to structure a work day in which people work for four days. After day four, they go home and they're essentially locked up, not maybe not fully quarantined, but not coming to the office for 10 days. We're waiting to see if symptoms manifest. Ideally, we're doing some testing. And if they're clear, we cycle them back at the end of those 10 days uh, with a fresh four-day work cycle. This clearly requires 
So that would greatly reduce transmission and allow people to be in the office. You'd, you'd obviously have different workers on different four days on cycles for this shift work. It would require massive coordination across tasks and sectors. So it doesn't help to have all of your workers on a 410 schedule if their kids daycare isn't managed for the four days they have to be in. It doesn't help to be on a 410 schedule if your suppliers are not on a similar 410 schedule and so you can't work with your suppliers and coordinate across, across the supply chain. So uh, massive coordination, but it may be, frankly, at least until we have effective treatments or vaccines, it may be the safest way to get folks back in the office in places where we need to have uh, folks physically proximate to one another or to customers. Um, I want to say, uh, and this is one where I'm going out on a limb, so you guys can all come back to me in 10 years and tell me if I'm wrong. I think the open floor plan is going to die. The new office is going to look much more like Mad Men than it's going to look like Google Campus. Uh, we're going to get rid of foosball tables. We're going to get rid of ping pong tables. We're going to go back to a world in which people are much more isolated from one another uh, at least until we have an effective vaccine. And depending on what the psychological um, and long run expectations are about future disease transmission, we may see that that, that um, remodel persists for quite a long time. And then the last thing I wanna note, and this is, um, this is gonna be disappointing even for those, those of us who are not working in these sectors, is that uh, one of the things we've learned from Zoom, I've learned personally, but many of us have learned, is that lots of types of business travel we used to do can effectively be handled through Zoom. And I want to be clear, not everything is uh, well done over Zoom, but Zoom and other, other platforms have done surprisingly well in bringing people together for small meetings to effectively work as a team. Um, this is almost certainly going to mean in the long run that firms are going to rethink those expensive business trips when they can on the margin at least move some of them to a virtual meeting format. As business travel contracts, obviously that's a, bit, that's a financial savings for firms. That's a financial hit for airlines who are already uh, pretty badly hit and hotels and everyone else in the, in that, in the travel sector. Uh, that's gonna have knock on effects for those of us who are only traveling for pleasure because of course, or maybe not of course, but let me point out that most of us flying at the back of the plane are being subsidized by those who are buying their tickets last minute at exorbitant rates. And so if those folks are no longer flying for business travel, we can expect our, 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 our tourist travel uh, expenses to go up as well. Um, so let me, I'm, I'm running out of time, so let me quickly talk uh, about a couple of unintended implications, three broadly speaking. First, uh, as firms move to uh, more and more remote work or even shift-based shift, shift, shift -based remote work, they're going to need smaller offices. Smaller offices is going to mean less demand for office space in urban centers and everywhere in which offices locate. And so we can expect a fall in, the commercial, in prices in the commercial real estate sector. That could spill over into the, into the residential housing market for a variety of reasons. One is because they compete for the same space. So less demand for commercial real estate means more of it can be dedicated to, uh, to residential and that should put some downward pressure on residential prices. But more importantly, it can also sort of ease the pressure on the white hot, white hot housing markets like San Francisco and New York City, which are, which are filled with people who need to be work, need, who need historically to be located near very high paying jobs and who may now be able to move to places more uh, distant uh, and, still, and still hold on to those, uh, those high paying salaries. Uh, that has implications for housing composition. I am currently talking to you from the dungeon in my house that is normally the game room for my children, much to their dismay, because I need a place to remotely work. And I didn't think about that when I was thinking about which house to buy. As we move forward, as more and more workers are working remotely, uh, we're gonna see, as, we saw, as, as I predicted, the death of the open floor plan at the office, I suspect there'll be some death of the open floor plan at home as well. Those big sweeping modern views where you have no walls from one end of your house to the other are not super conducive to a quiet work environment when you have other people that are sharing the house with you. Is that going to have massive uh, distributive implications for, for prices across housing types? Potentially. Um, where people are going to move is going to change as well. We're going to see more sprawl or at least some of the, some of the de sprawling we've seen in places like Atlanta where commute times have become uh, astronomical from the exurbs and the suburbs into the central business district. That will be less of an issue if people are able to work from home. 
And even in the Bay Area and California where real estate prices are sky high, we may see more distant sprawl to amenity rich locations that just don't have a historic job center. Boise, Idaho, I'm thinking of you. Boise is a lovely place without a lot of jobs, but if you can do your job from Boise and have to fly to the Bay Area once a week or once a month, uh, that may be a very, uh, a, a, that, that trade-off may become much more attractive than it was once, once before. Uh, and then let me last say on an issue that, that is extremely important to me, uh, I think as we transition to a workplace that is much more home-based, even if not exclusively so, we should see dramatic differences in environmental quality. It's clear in the immediate aftermath of COVID, many of you I'm sure have seen the pictures of what happened to pollution in Los Angeles and New York and Beijing. Pollution has dropped massively. Of course, we're now easing those social restrictions and pollution levels are climbing back up again. Uh, but less traffic and less regular work hour schedules is going to mean less congestion. Congestion, uh, all else equal, is creating more pollution than moving cars. And so uh, one bright spot in all of this is that uh, hopefully as we transition to a workplace that's more dynamic and less office-centered, uh, that we lose less of our time commuting in the car, which is a pure loss, uh, audible books notwithstanding, um, and, uh, and we, and we, and we uh, contribute less pollution to the environment. So let me end it there and turn to Liz. Oh, maybe, maybe let me set up Liz, which is to say, if any of the forecasts I've made about the transition to remote work are, are remotely plausible, the big challenge that lies before the, the labor market, before, before employers, is figuring out how to manage those workers in a way that doesn't look like management in an office. Uh, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand off to Liz and let her take over from there. Awesome, thank you, Josh. I'm gonna share my screen over yours. Great, I'm stopping my sharing, so you should be able to. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you so much for that um, intro. I think Josh has uh, hopefully, you know, sufficiently convinced people that, um, you know, well, as Alex mentioned, a lot of jobs can't be done remotely. The jobs that can be done remotely may be permanently uh, done so even after, um, after COVID passes. So I think when we're thinking about what this means for management and firm productivity, it, it's first, you know, worthwhile thinking about what do labor managers do to begin with? And why are these things going to be impacted by remote work? Um, so, I mean, of course, effective managers do a lot of things. Uh, here is an abbreviated list. Um, uh, they hire, they set objectives and try to incentivize workers to meet those objectives. They monitor, they train, they coordinate teamwork. That's a central job um, uh, of managers and one of the reasons we have firms to begin with. Um, and they help to retain workers. Of course, losing workers is expensive. Hiring is expensive. Um, and so these are, you know, some of the things managers do. And it's relatively easy to think about why these things could be affected by remote work. So for instance, there's evidence that some types of workers do pretty well from home and we're seeing that. Um, some workers are maintaining or increasing their productivity um, work from home and work from home and other workers actually don't do well working from home. They depend on that kind of energy they get from their coworkers in the office uh, and so if you're hiring for remote positions, you might want to be screening on that. That might change the type of person you hire. Similarly, the types of objectives you set may have to change. Um, while I don't think this is necessarily ideal, a lot of companies continue to reward workers based on how long they're sitting at their desk in the office. Um, and that may not be feasible um, with remote work. I'm gonna talk more about monitoring on the next slide because I think that's particularly important, so I won't discuss that here. In terms of training, as Josh uh, alluded to, a lot of on-the-job training happens through kind of tacit knowledge transfer. So workers see how their colleagues are performing, they observe the culture of the workforce, they observe the types of things their colleagues can get away with or the types of things that are truly valued by the firm. Um, and now with a shift to remote work, these types of things may have to be like formally codified um, because you're not going to get that tacit knowledge transfer um, either through manuals or through online training modules. But th th that transition is expensive um, and has to be kind of consciously, consciously done. Similarly, again, something Josh alluded to 
is that um, team, the way teamwork occurs remotely versus in person is, is quite different. Um, there's evidence that purely remote teams take a lot longer to become productive than in-person teams. There's a lot of reasons for this. One of them is that humans have a, a harder time building trust um, digitally, so over cameras like this, than they do in person. Um, there's less opportunity, for instance, um, for us to grab coffee uh, informally um, when we're working remotely versus in person, and this does affect the productivity of teams. And so managers are going to have to play an increased role in building this trust and it, potentially in coordinating teamwork uh, once we go remote. And again, I'll speak more about worker retention in a little bit. So poor performance on these dimensions of management actually have pretty serious implications for firm productivity. Um, a rigorous evaluation of global management practices demonstrates that even a relatively small increase in the performance of these um, tasks, as well as other managerial tasks, have um, large positive implications for firm performance. So for instance, a one-point increment in a five-point management scale is associated with 23% greater productivity, 14% higher market capitalization, and 1.4% faster annual sales growth. So these things matter and getting them right matters and getting them wrong has implications for firm productivity, but also overall productivity if all firms are doing this um, badly, for instance. Okay, so I wanna spend a bit more time on this issue of monitoring, which is I think um, particularly important when we think about how, how are we ensuring our workers are doing what we want them to do. Um, especially given that a lot of workers do increase performance when their boss is kind of walking by their cubicle all day long. Um, I don't always work hard, but when I do, I make sure my boss is around. Um, and when we're working remotely, our boss is never around. So does that mean we never perform? Um, I ran uh, an experimental study to assess the importance of increasing the salience, the visibility of monitoring among remote workers. And we find actually that this is, you know, extremely important. So this graph summarizes our results. Um, the, the bars basically measure the performance of, of workers. Um, the first set of three bars is the period prior to our monitoring intervention. Th these three are during the intervention and these are, are post. Um, the green bar demonstrates the monitoring status quo. This is basically workers um, were getting feedback if they were performing badly, if the managers were noticing problems, and they were receiving pay, which in some ways is, is an indication of monitoring. Um, for the orange bars, we uh, asked the managers to call workers every five days and just asked if they had questions, if they were con confused about their work. And this was a change relative to the status quo. Um, and then in the monitoring, the blue bars, what we did was ask managers to call workers again every five days, but this time provide feedback, either positive or negative, based on, on the performance of workers that went above and beyond just correcting workers when they were wrong. So um, at the start of the work period, once workers were just hired, they were all kind of performing fine. Um, we can see that in the status quo over the length of the observation period, which was about six months. Um, these workers basically stopped performing. And this was as they were learning or as they, they thought that their, maybe their work didn't matter, their managers weren't paying attention to them. And we may see this um, in, in the COVID environment. Right now, we're not seeing huge um, productivity declines, but it could be that you know, as workers learn that they can get away with things, um, their productivity will decline. In contrast, for those that were getting these calls just once every five days, um, not only did their performance not decline, it actually increased. Um, and what these workers reported is that they were feeling more valued by their managers. So they said like, oh, my manager's taking the time to observe what I'm doing. Um, my work must matter to the firm. And even after, you know, the, the call stopped, um, we do see a decline in performance, but not the same decline we see among workers um, who weren't having this happen. So that's certainly a sign that we do want um, visible monitoring. Josh mentioned the, the proliferation of these digital tracking tools, um, which of course allow for, for workers who are doing all their work on the computer, um, these tools allow managers to track basically everything workers are doing, um, what they're typing, uh, how often they're typing, what they're chatting with their colleagues, um, and so this overcomes this issue of not being able to watch what people are doing. Uh, the problem with this is that there is also evidence that too much monitoring is bad for, um, 
job satisfaction and that workers feel they're not trusted. Um, and this has uh, been shown to have negative effects on productivity. In addition, if workers believe that uh, what they're saying to their colleagues is being tracked, they may be less willing to, to take risks with what they're saying. So um, we really don't know what optimal monitoring for remote workers is. There's certainly you know, more salience, more effort needs to be put in from managers to make clear that workers are being monitored. Um, but the extent to which these tracking tools, which are, you know, produce data that's quite expensive to analyze, um, but also just um, may not be great for worker productivity. Um, you know, maybe there's a, there's a happy medium in there. Um, I want to conclude by saying, and I, you know, there are these cost savings that Josh mentioned, but in regular non-COVID times when we don't have um, children at home and we don't have this anxiety around uh, a global pandemic, um, remote work is associated with higher productivity among workers who want to be remote. Um, so there's a, uh, an experimental study that shows that among call center employees, those who choose, who, who, who voice a desire to go remote um, and are allowed to do so, increase their productivity by about 13%. And moreover, um, they are a lot less likely to leave the job. So um, this graph shows the likelihood of leaving a job over a 38 um, day period. And those who say they want to work remote but are kept in the office um, are far more likely, that's the control, they're far more likely to leave the job during the study period than those that, who are allowed to stay home. And this is another source of cost savings for firms on top of the real estate cost savings. Um, and these, these people who go remote are also um, more productive. Interestingly, however, to get back to my point about hiring, um, among this group who were allowed to go remote, about 50% opted to go back to the office because they, they just didn't enjoy um, being remote workers. And in fact, over time, their productivity suffered from being remote. So um, I, I think it's important to take into account when, uh, you know, firms are deciding who to hire and how to manage workers, um, who is best suited for these types of jobs. Um, and, you know, maybe not everyone is. And that again, also has productivity implications. Um, uh, a last point I wanna make, and I think Alex brought this up, um, US policy um, is not really set up for the virtual organization in that um, state labor and tax laws differ kind of to quite a big extent. Um, and managing these different regulations and laws can be quite costly for organizations. Um, and so I think that, you know, in addition to managerial adaptation, some policy adaptation may help us get to a point where um, managing these remote organizations is optimal and, and uh, good for productivity. Okay, so that's all I have. Um, and so we're gonna move into Q&A. I saw some raised hands. I'm hoping that anyone who has a raised hand can type their question into the Q&A box and I will um, feed those questions. Um, and so the first question I wanna get to is, I think um, for Alex, although uh, Josh, you might also have something to say about this. Um, someone asked, um, you know, it's nice that the, the government is replacing income, but what about um, people's like health insurance and other benefits, particularly in a time when, you know, people are obviously nervous about their health? Yeah, thanks, Liz, and, and thanks to the, the person who asked this question. It's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, in some cases, people are losing their health insurance through their jobs. Um, and those replacement rates that I quoted apply only to the wage component. Um, uh, like, in other words, the fraction of people's prior wages that are being replaced, not um, inclusive of the value of their health insurance benefits. And on average, in the United States, benefits are around 30% of compensation. So the, the value of those benefits can be quite large. Um, and, and, and certainly, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very good question. Now, with respect to health insurance in particular, um, there are certain particular provisions that allow people to, um, you know, potentially continue health insurance. So for example, there are special enrollment periods um, in uh, the federal marketplaces and some of the state, the state marketplaces that will allow people to um, continue health insurance coverage. There's COBRA, but of course that can be expensive as well. And so yes, absolutely. There are absolutely additional significant strains um, on, on workers coming from that. And in some cases, the extra income um, you know, coming from unemployment insurance may be, may be able to 
uh, allow them to afford that in part or in whole, and in other cases, it'll be insufficient. So thank you for raising that question. Awesome, thank you. Um, I have uh, another one, I think, for Alex. Um, you know, you may, again, may or may not have anything to say about this, but uh, how do you think the government weighs the, the decision of whether to make transfers uh, from, you know, relief packages to the private sector um, versus directly to private citizens? And, and what are the relative advantages maybe of giving money to, you know, small businesses versus giving it um, directly to uh, taxpayers? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult question to answer in general, um, you know, because giving it to taxpayer, giving it to taxpayers directly versus businesses, there are many ways of doing both of those types of transfers. So, um, so it's, it's hard to respond in general, but I think that with respect to the particular provisions of um, the CARES Act, um, I would agree with the questioner that probably there are some uh, transfers to particular industries that, in my opinion, um, have either been carried out in uh, inefficient ways or ways that um, sort of picked particular industries over other industries um, for reasons that are not always um, clear to me. So, um, so I would agree that um, the way, and, and moreover, there are, there are significant issues with the Paycheck Protection Program and how it's been implemented um, to date and its, and its adequacy to date. I think, um, Beyond that, I do think it is appropriate to, um, in my opinion, and other, and you know, others may disagree. Certainly, others do disagree. It is appropriate to have both um, both support for uh, individual citizens and for businesses, because if businesses fail, there is a certain amount of um, there's a certain amount of uh, sort of organizational capital in a business, you know, how do the different structures interact with each other, you know, there's a whole, you know, when you create a business, you create a whole, um, a whole world and the fiber of that world comes apart when the business fails. And so um, if we just destroyed all businesses and then tried to rebuild them from scratch after COVID ends, that would, in my opinion, be, um, be inefficient. So I think that it is appropriate to offer some, um, some support to businesses, but I would tend to agree with the questioner's, um, you know, overall orientation, which is that, in my view, the the support to businesses was done inefficiently and was weaker than I, uh, sorry, was stronger than I would have liked. Oh, sorry, relative to support, I, I would have personally designed the packages to support individual citizens a bit more and a bit less support to individual businesses, particularly, um, and, and I also question the way that it was actually implemented. But I do think it is appropriate to have some degree of support for business. And I, I just want to jump in here and say one, one thing that, that I know Alex knows, but I want to put a fine point on, which is, uh, while it is true that, uh, that there, is a, there is a fabric to firms, or let me, let me put it differently, uh, when firms die, uh, re reconstituting them is much more expensive than keeping them on life support. I think the real challenge in this picking across industries is that uh, some firms need to die um, and be reborn as something else in this in this moment. And this moment may precipitate a lot of that churn, or as 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 a uh, Schumpeter would refer to, uh, creative destruction. Uh, and and so the challenge when you're picking who to save is that it's not always clear who needs to evolve into something else and who doesn't. And, and so I, I think that, that, that policy logic is, is always strained because it's informed by history and not by, by, by the future. Yeah, those are great points. We have some kind of related questions um, about context outside of the US. Um, so I'm going to get to those and, and see what you uh, both have to say. I'm going to continue directing them at both of you. Um, uh, so the first is about countries in which the majority of the labor force is informal um, and how to think about targeting relief payments to, you know, people who aren't registered taxpayers or people who don't have uh, formal employment or, you know, in the, in the context of the U.S. potentially undocumented. Um, immigrants. How do we how do we think about policy that gets money to these people um, in, in an efficient way? Uh, 
I'm happy to take this. I'm happy to defer to Josh if you'd like. <laughs> Go uh, ahead and I'll, I'll jump in. Okay. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> rereading or reading the, the questioner's question, you know, specifically about, you know, the support for unemployment for undocumented workers and others who were informally employed, this is a major issue, um, and in my opinion, because if you, so if you were not reporting wages, um, you know, you, you didn't have taxable wages under unemployment insurance, you don't have a wage history, and so you're not eligible for unemployment insurance now. And, <clears throat> Um, and there are a number of groups of workers for whom that's true. Now, the, the CARES Act did make self-employed workers and certain other groups of workers eligible, um, which they wouldn't normally have been, but there are major groups of people that are left out of that. Um, and groups that were receiving wages under the table in particular um, are in desperate straits right now in a lot of cases. So this is a major, major issue. Um, and I'm glad that the questioner raised it. It's one that I've raised in, in my class as well that I'm teaching. Um, so I think it does point to a major hole in the safety net, um, particularly right now. And um, <clears throat> I think it's one that policymakers should be looking at right now because, um, because uh, the consequences can be, can be very dire um, and, and are very dire right now for, for a number of families in that situation. I guess the only thing I would add to that is that um, the U.S. system is 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 somewhat of an outlier in the sense that most of the social social safety net that we provide is directed through a redistributive tax system. That's not that's less true in Europe and and not at all true in lots of developing countries where that safety net is provided through other means that are not directed towards or, or not, not tied to earned income. Uh, they all involve trade-offs. Uh, those trade-offs are tricky under normal circumstances. They're really brought to bear in these emergency circumstances where you need to transfer money for survival, for pure survival uh, on a large scale and you need some basis for doing so. And so I think in, in resource poor countries, uh, the mode for doing that is different because it's not tied to income, but also the infrastructure for actually directing those payments is also uh, less uh, functional or functions with more, more glitches. And so I, I, I do worry, moving outside the U.S. context, I do worry that the informal sector and, and the self-employed and the subsistence farmer and everybody uh, who falls, in, uh, falls between the, the the, the cracks is going to be very difficult to identify and then get transfers uh, to, to keep them going. Um, and that epidemic is just starting to surge in the, and the epidemic is just starting to surge in those countries. So we're, 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 we've got a rocky road ahead of us. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Um, we have, you know, about six minutes left. So I, there are two other groups of uh, questions that maybe we can um, address. Um, again, to the uh, two US policy experts on this panel. Um, do you think that uh, what's going on right now could change um, you know, long-term US um, healthcare policy and also parental leave or childcare policy? I will answer the question by evading the question. Uh, I will say if, if it doesn't happen now, I don't know when it will happen, but that doesn't mean it will happen. <laughs> um, this is this is clearly a moment to reassess the social safety net, the 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 educational system in the United States, the healthcare system in the United States. There are a lot of things that um, we all knew were a little clunky in their operation, but have really been stress test in a way that's unprecedented through this pandemic. Whether that's enough to surmount the very um, the very complicated uh, politics of those reforms uh, is 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 unclear, and of course, all those reforms will will cost money, and and money is going to be scarce for the near term. Alex, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, no, I would agree. I would I would sort of refer back to you know what I said about things being highly uncertain. It's it's very hard to say um, what will come out of this uh, in terms of the longer term reforms, and I think that would apply to this in particular. Yeah. Okay. Great. I, I guess maybe just say one one more thing, Liz, which is, I I think 
I think one thing that might be possible is that we'll see massive reform, um, but it will be massive reform by uh, branded under something else. Um, and so what I mean by that is, for example, when we bailed out the initial, ba the initial uh, stimulus package post-COVID to, to help out the airlines, had clauses about uh, government ownership of those airlines in exchange for those loans if repayments were not made on time. That sort of nationalization would be called a you know, socialist plot under different times and different regimes, but, but, it, but was bipartisanly written into that legislation. We won't call it uh, nationalization, but, but if in fact there are defaults, that's what it is. Um, so there may be reforms, at least on the margin, that look like, that are in fact substantively major reforms, but aren't branded as such. Okay, good point, thank you. Um, and then the, the last topic, getting back to the, the question of remote work, um, there have been like a series of questions of what, what types of jobs can be remote and also for the types of jobs that can't be remote, maybe like manufacturing, is this going to speed up a move to automation? Um, and again, like Josh pointed out, a lot of these changes were happening um, pre-COVID, but is this speeding up automation? And uh, what types of sectors do we see um, being able to move remote versus not? Sorry. I can start. Oh, go ahead, Josh. Go, go ahead, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> well, so um, so it's interesting. So the the Dingle and Nyman study that I that I referenced earlier has a really interesting sort of breakdown of um, the types of jobs that can be done from home, both by occupation and industry. So um, so in terms of by industry, uh, the ones that can be done the most from home are uh, are are industries like educational services. Eighty three percent can be done from home. That's the industry that we're all in, of course, and we are teaching our classes by Zoom. Um, finance and insurance, professional scientific, scientific and, and technical services, information management, things like that. Um, whereas there are, so those are all sort of in the 70 to 80% range that can be done from home. The bottom five are industries like transportation and warehousing, construction, retail trade, agriculture, accommodation and food services, which are more in the range of like 5% to 20% that can be done from home. So, um, so huge, huge variation across the spectrum, um, ranging from people like ourselves that are largely able to do things from home, albeit you know, in, a, in a different way, like over Zoom, um, to those like in accommodation and food services that um, you know, it really has to, has to be done in person, essentially, um, almost all of the time, except for you know, takeout and so forth. And then by occupation, there are certain occupations like computer and mathematical occupations, 100% uh, are, are deemed to be uh, doable from home. Um, so there are certain occupations that can almost always be done from home, education, training, and library occupations, again, like the ones we're in, legal occupations can almost always be done from home. And then, you know, building and grounds cleaning and maintenance op operations, 0% can be done. Uh, from home. So wide variation across the spectrum. And you can see in some of the examples that I gave how it is that, um, for example, lower income occupations um, tend to be hit harder by this, uh, you know, such as building and grounds cleaning uh, tend to be hit harder, whereas, you know, higher income occupations like finance and insurance, um, various types of management services and so forth um, can, can much more often uh, be done from home. So, uh, you know, as well as some of the, the gender uh, inequality as well, that uh, women tend to be in occupations that can be done less easily uh, from home uh, disproportionately. So, um, so yeah, so there's a lot of variation across the spectrum, across industry and occupation. Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Let, let me jump in and just say, I, I, I agree with, with, with what Alex said and the thrust of the study, but it would only underscore that it takes a very static view of what firms and industries look like. Um, once upon a time, not that long ago, farms in the United States employed lots of people in labor. Uh, now much of that is automated and done by one person in a very expensive and fancy tractor. Um, while we're not quite there yet, uh, landscaping may be done by drone. <laughs> Um, and, and I would just say in restaurant, I've been thinking a lot about restaurants. I have a very good friend who's a restaurateur in, in, in Northern California. Um, and I think one thing that will be interesting, we'll see whether, it, what, whether this is right, but it's, it's, one might imagine that restaurants, restaurants currently provide two, two goods bundled together. They provide entertainment and they provide deliciousness. Um, deliciousness can be provided remotely. It may involve tinkering with, with, with recipes on the margin, but they can be delivered remotely. 
entertainment cannot. And so it may be that we see that restaurants morph into a more specialized uh, area or domain of this of, of their current of their current portfolio of, of services and say, look, I'm going to provide delicious meals. I'm going to retool my menu so that they travel better uh, and do all kinds of things to, to keep my business alive through, through a delivery outlet, uh, which will obviously employ people who have to move the food from one place to another and move and employ people who have to cook the food, but, but none of the smiling faces at the front of the restaurant. Um, that may that may be the new normal, and so you know it may be that while restaurants can't be done remotely, restaurants may not be done. Uh, this is hyperbolic, of course. There will be restaurants, but uh, the restaurant industry may be permanently changed from what it looked like before to one that is uh, much more heavily reliant on um, on on delivery and 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 remote uh, remote delivery of services as opposed to in person delivery of services. Yeah. I think that's a great point to conclude on. Um, we're out of time. I think in general, we've established that lots is going to change and probably permanently. Um, uh, US policy, obviously, there might be you know permanent changes in how that's carried out, permanent changes in how work's done, but also permanent changes in the types of services um, that we get delivered and the types of firms that we see succeeding. So again, this creative destruction that, that Josh alluded to is going to be happening, uh, not just right now, but, but going forward for quite a while. Wendy, do you want to? Thank, thanks for including me in the panel. I very much enjoyed it. Thanks for the terrific questions, everyone. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And on behalf of everyone on the line, please let me thank our panelists, Alex, Josh, Liz. This was an amazing conversation and I wish we would have had more time because there are still a ton of questions, but uh, we appreciate the knowledge you were able to share with us today. Uh, next week, we have another exciting lineup for you, uh, led by GPS's own Barbara Walter. This group of panelists will dive into the topic of domestic unrest and discuss whether America is at war with itself. So we hope we'll see you next week. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in today. Bye-bye.